Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, Neurophysician from Rajmandri, Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the books Focus Neurology and Exam Oriented Clinical Neurology. My email is 3klpm at gmail.com. Today we are going to talk about a fascinating topic, the interpretation of CT head. The interpretation of CT head, neuroimaging concepts, part 3, the interpretation of CT head. These are the important landmarks of the CT head anatomy and therefore one has to get familiarized with this CT scan anatomy. This is probably the most important slice of the CT head wherein there are important landmarks, especially the internal capsule because the internal capsule is one region where the infarct is very very common and therefore one has to get familiarized with these important landmarks. So if we see here as I said in the earlier edition the CSF appears dark so these are the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle so these are the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle and here you can see this is the third ventricle and this is the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle uh, just adjacent just adjacent to the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle is the caudate nucleus so very very important landmark here is the caudate nucleus this is the genu of the corpus callosum and this is the splenium of the corpus callosum just adjacent to the third ventricle is the thalamus and of course now we are talking about the most important anatomical a landmark of uh, head is the internal capsule so here you can see this dark area this is the internal capsule so this is the internal capsule very very important so this is the anterior limb of the internal capsule you can see this is the genu and this is the posterior limb of the internal capsule so you must be remembering in the anatomy that this is the area where all the important tracts are present so this is the area where we have the corticospinal tract and the sensory tracts are also present here and here in the genu we have the corticobulbar tract the anterior limb of the internal capsule we don't have uh, many important tracts we have the pape circuit going in the anterior limb of the internal capsule we have the frontoponto cerebellar uh, fibers going through the internal capsule and we have the saccadic pathway going through the internal capsule so the three important tracks going through the anterior limb of the internal capsule is the saccadic pathway coming from the front life fields area number eight and going traversing the anterior limb of the internal capsule and going to the pprf on the opposite side uh, one more important track which goes to the anterior limb of the internal capsule is the pape circuit uh, you will be remembering it as a very important circuit for memory and then the bulk of the afferent fibers of the cerebellum comes from the frontal lobe through the pons which is known as frontoponto cerebellar fibers they also go through the anterior limb so these are the important tracks going to the anterior limb of the internal capsule and in the genome we have the cortico bulbar fibers so when the cortico bulbar fibers get affected we have the face being affected uh, more commonly and then this is the most important part of the internal capsule that is the posterior limb of the internal capsule where we have the corticospinal fibers coming and we have the thalamic radiations also uh, ascending uh, uh, from the posterior limb of the internal capsule so beneath it is the optic radiation and the auditory radiations so this is again i repeat very very important landmark this is the internal capsule so again if you see here this is the anterior limb of the internal capsule this is the genu this is the posterior limb of the internal capsule so what is the blood supply of the anterior limb genu and the posterior limb of the internal capsule so you can divide the internal capsule the blood supply as the upper part 
and the lower part the upper part the entire upper part is supplied by the middle cerebral arteries so entire upper part is supplied by the middle cerebral arteries the lower part we can divide it into three parts the upper one third the middle one third and the lower one third so upper one third middle one third and the lower one third so again the blood supply is easy to remember ac pc and ac so here it is the anterior cerebral artery a branch of which is hubenous artery which supplies the anterior limb and here you have the posterior uh, cerebral artery supplying here and then when you come to the posterior part it is the ac again it is the anterior choroidal artery a branch of internal carotid artery which supplies the lower part of the posterior limb of the internal capsule so the blood supply of the internal capsule the entire upper part is by the middle cerebral artery the lower part you can divide it into three parts upper middle and lower one third ac pc ac ac is the anterior cerebral artery a branch of which is hubenous artery which supplies it here is pc posterior cerebral artery some books say as posterior communicating artery and then we have the ac the anterior choroidal artery a branch of the internal carotid artery again we have important tracks here going auditory radiations and the visual radiations optic radiations also go through this so when the anterior limb gets affected we don't have much uh, problem as well I, as i said earlier the three important parts are the pape circuit the frontopontal cerebral fibers and the front life fields area number eight the saccadic pathway going through this but if the genu gets affected that is a hubenous artery of the anterior artery supplies the anterior limb and the genu here it is a border area so when this uh, ac anterior anterior cerebral artery branch of which is hubenous artery which affects this area the cortico bulbar fibers get affected so they have facio brachial uh, paresis so face and the hand gets affected because the face the cortico bulbar fibers are here but this is the area most often affected this is the anterior choroidal artery a branch of uh, internal carotid artery so if it affects this area what happens the corticospinal tracts are all close together here they come from the cortical area like this like this from the ant from the medial part of the frontal loop the leg area the hand area face area all come and they converge on the posterior limb of the internal capsule and therefore the internal capsule if it gets affected there will be a dense hemiplegia meaning that the upper limb and the lower limb get affected equally but if it is only the medial part of the frontal lobe if it gets affected only the leg area gets affected uh, if the if this area gets affected the face and the hand area get affected this is supplied by the middle cerebral artery and this is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery so the main anterior cerebral artery supplies the leg area middle part of the frontal lobe but a branch of the anterior cerebral artery hubenous artery supplies the uh, the genu and the anterior limb and therefore you have the facio brachial monoparesis so this is the area where you have the corticospinal fibers converging you have the thalamic radiations ascending so if there's a lesion here in the posterior limb of the internal capsule especially if the anterior choroidal artery a branch of internal carotid artery if it is if it affects this area what happens is a dense hemiplegia upper limb and lower limb gets affected equally that's why you call this dense hemiplegia if it is affects only here the leg area gets affected if it affects here only the supplied by the mca if this area supplied by mca is affected only face uh, only the uh, face and hand get affected if this area supplied by the aca gets affected only the leg area gets affected but uh, internal carotid artery a branch of which is uh, the anterior choroidal artery if it affects this area post limb of the internal capsule leg and hand hand area get affected equally you call it as a dense hemiplegia and all the sensory fibers also arise in this area therefore there will be hemesthesia also so the optic radiations also go nearby and therefore they also get affected so the classic finding of the anterior choroidal artery a branch of internal carotid artery involvement is hemiplegia hemesthesia and homonymous anopia hemiplegia because the corticospinal fibers are affected hemesthesia because the thalamic radiations are affected and uh, homonymous hemianopia because the optic radiations get affected so this is the most important area the posterior limb of the internal uh, uh, posterior limb of the internal capsule which is supplied by the uh, anterior choroidal artery branch of internal carotid artery 
so here you have the thalamus so another important uh, uh, concept regarding the internal capsule uh, and the thalamus is that uh, especially in hypertension hypertension is the one of the most important modifiable respect risk factor for stroke and therefore if there's hypertension if there is uh, small small infarcts we call as lacunar infarcts suppose there is uh, slum dilatation of the end arteries aneurysm it can cause hemorrhage so whether it is hemorrhage or infarct uh, certain areas get affected if it is due to hypertension they are the putamen that is a lentiform nucleus then the pons then the thalamus and the cerebellum so these are the important areas so if there's a hypertensive hemorrhage the cerebellum gets affected the pons get affected the thalamus get affected the putamen gets affected in fact the putamen is one of the most common areas of hypertensive hemorrhage then thalamic hemorrhage pontine hemorrhage and cerebellar hemorrhage so again same thing if hypertension if it affects the uh, lenticular striate arteries of the mca or the end arteries it results in lacunar infarcts so lacunar infarcts are also common in these areas that is the posterior limb of the internal capsule you can have in the thalamus and the pons and the cerebellum also so another important concept is that uh, cerebellum can cause ataxia but if pons gets affected also they'll have ataxic hemiparesis so ataxia means not necessarily cerebellum should get affected even if the cerebellar fibers go into the cerebellum if it gets affected also it results in ataxia that's why in pons where the, the bulk of fibers goes from the frontal lobe to the pons to the cerebellum if that get affects pons gets affected they can have ataxia because frontopontal cerebellar fibers goes to the pons so these are all the important concepts so you have the caudate nucleus which is very important if this area gets affected patient will develop an involuntary movement known as chorea if thalamus and underneath that uh, subthalamus if it gets affected they can have the hemibalismus if the splenium of the corpus callosum gets affected a very interesting phenomenon known as alexia without agraphia uh, results that means uh, they can write but they cannot read what they have just written because the speech area the language area is on the left side and the pca supplies the splenium of the corpus callosum and therefore if the pca gets affected the splenium of the corpus callosum gets affected the occipital cortex gets affected so the information the visual information from the occipital cortex cannot be transferred via the splenium of the corpus callosum to the language areas and therefore patient can write but cannot read what he has just written because the visual areas are not able to access the language areas because the splenium of the corpus callosum is affected because of the pca infarct and another important landmark is the sylvian fissure here you can see the sylvian fissure anterior to that is the broca's area so here what happens is that patient is able to understand but is not able to speak posterior to that is the vernix area that is the sensory aphasia uh, patient speaks fluently but it is a nonsense means he is not able to understand so these are the impo this is the interhemispheric fissure these are the important landmarks so this is the genu of the corpus callosum front lines of the lateral ventricle uh, when there is a when there is an accumulation of CSF, especially the normal pressure hydrocephalus, the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles get dilated and it goes impinches on the medial part of the frontal lobe. As I said earlier, you have the leg area here and therefore in NPH they will have gait ataxia. The bladder control is also in the medial part of the frontal lobe. So they will have incontinence of the urine and the memory, especially the immediate memory dorsomedial lateral frontal cortex is also here. So they will have memory impairment. So in NPH, since this area gets affected, they'll have a triad, incontinence of the urine, gait apraxia and memory involvement. So this is the area, medial part of the frontal lobe, which is predominantly supplied by the ACA. This area, the sylvian fissure adjacent to this is supplied by the MCA and posteriorly this is supplied by the PCA, including the spinium of the corpus callosum. So very, this is the third ventricle. So very, very important uh, uh, slice this is. So as I said earlier, please remember this. This is the anterior limb this is the genu this is the posterior limb of the internal capsule this is marked well here a very very important uh, anatomical landmark so these are all the important landmarks
so these sometimes we get confused uh, you have normal physiological calcification i said uh, in the earlier edition that the uh, hu units hounsfield units is very high for the calcium and the bone therefore the bone appears white the calcium appears white so there are some areas which have uh, normal physiological calcifications so this is the pineal gland you can see the calcification here these are the as i said these are the ventricle occipital horns of the lateral ventricles so these are the choroid plexus they can also have uh, calcification and here you can see the uh, dura mater here you can see the calcifications here so these are all the normal calcifications we should not get confused with hemorrhage saying that there is a hemorrhage here these are all the normal physiologic calcifications the pineal gland calcification the choroid plexus calcification the dural calcifications another important point about the pineal gland is that if you can see here that it is the center it is in the center of the brain and therefore if there is a raised intracranial pressure and if there is a shift of the midline structures you can just check out on the pineal gland if there is a movement of the pineal gland to the other side instead of being in the midline that means there is a raised intracranial pressure and there is a shift of midline structures so shift of midline structures we can assess by looking at the pineal gland the pineal gland moves aside that means it is not in the center so there is a there is a content which is under pressure and is increasing on the other side and it is pushing the pineal gland to the other side so we say the shift of midline structures that is we look out at the pineal gland that indicates indirectly that there is a raised intracranial pressure so we should get familiarized with all these normal physiological uh, calcifications also and yeah as i said in the last uh, episode uh, the blood uh, contains a very high hounsfield units hu and the infarct or the edema contains a low hounsfield units so here you can see that this is very this is dark in color so this is dark in color this is hypodense so this indicates infarction whereas here you can see it is white in color so this is high hounsfield unit this indicates hemorrhage so hemorrhage appears you can see here hemorrhage appears hyperdense infarction appears hypodense so this is hemorrhage it appears hyperdense and this is infarct which appears uh, hypodense so by looking at the density we can know whether it is hemorrhage or infarction very very important in the diagnosis of stroke because if a person comes with sudden onset of weakness we think it is a stroke uh so again we need to confirm it whether it is infarction or hemorrhage because if a person comes in the window period if we thrombolize the patient it will really help the patient in a big way so the first indication whether we can thrombolize or not is to confirm infarct and rule out hemorrhage and how do we rule out hemorrhage easiest modality available is ct head and when we take ct head and if we see that there is no hemorrhage that is there's no white in color uh, either it is of the normal density or hypodensity then we know that it is infarction definitely there is no hemorrhage because there is no uh, white in color that is no hyperdensity so we can go ahead with thrombolysis so very very important the moment a person comes first in the hospital with a clinical suspicion of uh, stroke we take CT head we, it is a very important uh, diagnostic modality where we can find out whether it is hemorrhage or infarction hemorrhage appears white and infarction appears black so here you can see as i said in my previous uh, discussion on my previous slide this is a classic site of putamen lentiform nucleus so this is the classic site of hemorrhage hypertensive hemorrhage putamen hemorrhage hypertensive hemorrhage occurs in in definite in few areas which give us the clue that is a hypertensive hemorrhage putamen pons thalamus and cerebellum so you can see hemorrhage in this area this is a putamen hemorrhage characteristic site of hypertensive bleed so they may very uh, important concept is that hypertensive bleed occurs in putamen pons thalamus and cerebellum and of these four sites putamen is the most common condition so here i just looking at the ct head i can even tell the etiology this is the hemorrhage and this is due to hypertension you can see a classic putamen hemorrhage in fact it has gone and into the ventricles also the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle it has gone it has gone into the third ventricle also here you can see it is going into the other side also oxford horn of the lateral ventricles as i said in the previous uh, uh, slide 
so you can see the there's a slight shift also so there's a midline it's not in the straight line you can see the shift of the midline structures as i said the pineal gland will be the landmark so it has gone to the other side so this person has got a raised ict there's a shift of the midline structures there's a putamen hemorrhage it has gone into the front lawn of the lateral ventricle occipital lawn of the lateral ventricle there's a shift of midline structures occipital lawn of the lateral ventricle so this is a, this patient has got a poor prognosis because it is already extended into the ventricle the moment hemorrhage extends into the ventricle the prognosis becomes very poor so this is a classic site of hypertensive hemorrhage putamen so hemorrhage appears hyperdense now if we check out on this slide this is hypodense so this is hypodense so hypodense means as i said this is infarction infarction appears hypodense and even by looking at the site you can tell which arteries involved so this is the medial part of the temporal lobe it is just adjacent to the midbrain so the posterior cerebral artery comes here winds around and supplies the medial part of the temporal lobe and occipital lobe so this is the classic site of pca infarction so this is a posterior cerebral artery infarction so this patient has got posterior cerebral artery infarction it appears black it is in the site of the posterior cerebral artery here this is the site of the putamen this appears hyperdense white so this is hemorrhage and the classic site is putamen so it's a hypertensive hemorrhage going under the front lawns of the lateral ventricle occipital lawns of the lateral ventricle there's a shift of the midline structures you can see hemorrhage uh, in the occipital lawn of the lateral ventricles so ct scan becomes a very very important modality uh, in the diagnosis of stroke so these are the three important distribution of the cerebral arteries one we have the anterior cerebral artery here you can see the anterior cerebral artery infarction this is a classic site and this is the posterior cerebral artery infarction and this is the middle cerebral artery infarction which is huge you can see here so as i said here the mca divides into the lenticlostriate arteries which supplies the internal capsule and then it divides into superior branch and the inferior branch the superior branch supplies this is the sylvian fissure so the superior branch supplies the broca's area so this is the broca's area so if on the left side if it is affected patient will have broca's aphasia that means he can understand but he cannot speak and if it is posterior to the sylvian fissure if it is on the left side the vernix area gets affected that means he cannot understand but he keeps on speaking and uh, the leg area is here but the face and hand are here so predominantly in the mca distribution uh, the hand gets affected more than the leg and therefore the person is present with hemiplegia wherein hand is affected more than the leg that means it is the mca infarction so these are the classic uh, presentation of mca they'll have aphasia uh, they'll have aphasia they'll have uh, hemiplegia wherein the upper limb is affected more than the lower limb and then they can have uh, uh, since the cortex is affected they can present with seizures they can present with apraxia so when a person has got apraxia aphasia uh, hemiplegia uh, and uh, as i said the cortical signs then it is a cortical infarction whereas if it's an internal capsule lesion as i told in the last slide patient may have dense hemiplegia hemisthesia and homonymous semianopia but since it's a subcortical area they will not have cortical signs like aphasia or apraxia so a person without cortical signs only having dense hemiplegia hemisthesia or homonymous semianopia it is an internal capsule or subcortical lesion person has got aphasia or apraxia and if it is on the non dominant side they can have hemi neglect parietal lobe involved with hemiplegia that means it is the cortical area gets affected this is mca now when we come to the aca the anterior artery pre predominantly supplies the medial part of the frontal lobe as i said earlier here you have the leg area and therefore predominantly the hemiplegia may be there but the leg gets affected more than the hand and if it is bilaterally involved both the leg areas get affected in fact one of the common causes of uh, para cerebral cause of paraplegia is the either bilateral anterior cerebral artery involvement or the one anterior cerebral artery involvement with the other anterior cerebral artery is uh, not uh, really dominant and supplying so one of the important causes is of uh, cerebral cause of paraplegia aca involvement uh, or any area or even any sinus or any any area which affects this area uh, uh, or any sol any area affecting this area the medial part of the frontal lobe the leg area gets affected predominantly and they can present with the uh, uh, leg weakness crural weakness if both sides get affected they can have paraparesis and then finally we have the posterior cerebral artery in involvement as i said 
this predominantly supplies the occipital lobe and therefore the patient presents with the visual problems they can present with uh, cortical blindness they will not be able to see uh, so very interesting is that if a person presents with the AC environment or MC environment the corticospinal tract gets affected and they will have weakness but in posterior cerebral artery environment the corticospinal tract is not involved and therefore patient will not have hemiplegia so just because a person is not having hemiplegia does not mean that the person is not having stroke so stroke means just not weakness stroke means an acute focal neurological deficit due to vascular cause so if the pc is involved and the, since the corticospinal tracts are not involved here they run in the internal capsule and go to the midbrain they don't go traverse this area so pca involvement usually they'll have visual problems cortical blindness they will not have hemiplegia so just because they present with visual problems and no weakness it does not mean it is a, it is not a stroke it is a stroke so post cerebral artery involvement stroke they present with sudden onset of visual loss without weakness then you have to think of post cerebral artery involvement as i said the language area is on the left side and therefore if the left pca in fact if the left post cerebral artery is involved and the pca is also involved the visual processing or the information cannot be traversed to the language area so patient presents with alexia without agraphia they can write because it goes slightly anterior and and writing does not need vision even by closing the eyes we can write so it is only the reading gets affected and therefore one of the classic uh, symptoms of the left post cerebral artery involvement is that patient presents with alexia without agraphia that is uh, difficulty in reading but no difficulty in writing so these are the important uh, anterior cerebral artery anti-circulation stroke that is the mca and aca and when it comes to the posterior circulation stroke the pca two vertebral arteries join together to form basilar artery and divide into posterior cerebral artery so vertebro basilar circulation we call it the posterior circulation posterior cerebral artery the internal carotid artery divides into the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery so this we call it as the anterior circulation so anterior circulation is the stroke uh, resulting from the carotid artery and its branches and posterior circulation stroke is the because of the vertebro based artery territory so these are the important ct scan landmarks which one has to get familiarized with and as i said uh, the ct scan is superior to mri for bony lesions so here you can see the ct scan is superior for the detection of bony pathology such as trauma you can see the fractures here so ct scan can pick up the very well so ct scan is very very important it is a first line modality to for stroke because it helps in ruling out hemorrhage so that we can go ahead and thrombolize the patient in persons with head injury the subdural hematoma or extra dural hematoma since it is uh, it is hemorrhage it can pick it up and then uh, this is very important uh, for bony pathology it is superior to mri and therefore any fracture or any involvement can be picked up by ct or mri easily so the superiority of ct or mri uh, lesions so these are the important concepts of the CT head interpretation. I hope you have enjoyed listening to it. The other important concepts of clinical neurology, I put it in a book called Exam Only Clinical Neurology. It will be very useful for students appearing for clinical neurology exams. If interested, this could, book could be purchased. I am the author, Dr. S. Srinivas. And the other book I have written is Focused Neurology. All the important concepts of neurology, I put it in a question and answer format available in the book focused neurology published by cbs publishers and uh, distributors this book is available online from all leading booksellers including amazon so if this if you are interested this good this book could be purchased online focused neurology written by me dr s Srinivas. i hope you have enjoyed listening to all my all the important uh, concepts of uh, neurology uh, if you have really enjoyed it or uh, liked it uh, please like and share my youtube channel dr s Srinivas the Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts. It is India's leading neurology educational YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts. Please like, share the link and please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my B page, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you.